This is Gabe Ignetti. This is the Eco Modernist Soapbox. With us today is Marco Roser Rossi, and he is a PhD candidate in political science at the University of Illinois in Chicago, with a focus on urban politics. He's also a writer and has been published in Z Magazine, The Humanist, The New Compass, and most recently, The Journal of Climate and Capitalism. Marco, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Before we get into the subject of what we want to talk about today, which is eco-socialism and eco-modernism, let's talk a little bit about your latest article, which is in Climate and Capitalism Journal, and that was Reconsidering Nuclear Power. Could you speak a little about the article and the exchange that followed? Sure. So the journal is run by Ian Angus who it advertises an eco-socialist journal. And the article made a case for nuclear power from basically a socialist perspective. We have two major issues facing us in the world today. One is trying to pull billions of people out of poverty. The other one is trying to deal with the climate crisis and increasing in emissions. And there is very few technological options available that can accomplish both those things. Um, Nuclear power is one of the few options once we go through essentially all the record with all the environmental concerns, all the economic concerns that can provide a lot of energy to a lot of people throughout the world with having a minimal impact on the environment. So it's saying that the movement for eco socialism should reconsider sort of this trend it's had, this tradition it's had opposed to nuclear power. Okay, so how about the pushback and what people were saying to you in response to this? I had got some positive response. I got some negative response. I didn't feel like it's the case with any article that's written. The one thing I really did engage with is there is a faction of the environmental movement that is convinced that the environmental crisis has gone such a degree that the only way we can get out of it is to dramatically reduce economic growth. And I think that is fundamentally wrong. I think it's wrong on two accounts. One, I find it extraordinarily inhumane. It ignores the fact that there are literally billions of people in the world who exist in poverty. And two, which I think a lot of people who lean toward ego modernism or attract some of ideas realize is that de- developing an ecological consciousness is really dependent on that they reach a state of post-scarcity, that they're no longer having to just barely get by on a minimum type of subsistence existence. Humans have a interesting relationship with the natural world. Is they see it either, which is a very materialistic way of approaching the natural world, or they see it as fulfilling more non-material means of aesthetic, recreation, sort of some type of grander meaning. And we can't get to those other needs unless we set aside first category. Until we can guarantee that everyone has a minimum standard, they're never gonna wanna engage in conservation for conservation's sake. You're never gonna get people to save an endangered species if they have to struggle with poverty and they have to use natural resources to, to do that. So I think it's critical that we try to increase production and pull people out of poverty while the same try and trying to find ways to do that that is beneficial for the environment. And for me, once you look at all the facts, you, you look at all the energy options that are available to us, nuclear power definitely provides that. It provides a lot of energy with very few inputs, and that's a great advantage to it. And it's very strange to have some people who identify as press women and part of the left who say that they have concerns for people who have to do with poverty and want to leave that, but at the same time adopt a lot of prescriptions that would make those people's lives more difficult. And when it comes to environmental issues, they tend to ignore how we need to increase production if we're really going to pull people out of poverty. I think the root of it is that environmentalism, at least in the United States and for much of the growing world, it really came apart in the progressive era. And a lot of the political distinctions that we have now, they were much different than they were 100 years ago. So all the earliest environmentalists that were part of the progressive movement, like uh, Gifford Pinchot and John Muir, who started the Sierra Club, 
yes, they wanted to engage in conservation. They were part of the Roosevelt administration, talk about these big public parks. But they were all also eugenicists, and they all had very racist tendencies. And they had a lot of nativist ideas to them. So their environmentalism was really like, we want to protect the planet, not for everybody, but for a particular set of people, particularly white people. And we want to put the burden of that protection on other people who are poor or people of color or in different parts of the world. And because the environmentalism has always been part of the progressive movement, it still today has tendencies, even if people aren't conscious of it, in terms of the policies it recommends that sort of have that effect. A lot of the anxiety about nuclear power, it was really concerned about overpopulation. And even though a lot of people today, they don't have the same concerns about overpopulation, they still hold on to a lot of the propaganda that was sort of projected with that concern. And I think it's very troubling. You know, a lot of people don't realize how much this part of contemporary environmentalism, even up to the 2000s, the Sierra Club board was still casting votes to see if it was going to be, has a policy against immigration into the United States. And so I think really the environmental movement really has to reconcile with this history and realize that the policies that promote today really have to do with this really ugly past that it hasn't dealt with. I think you could go even further back than that, because this Malthusian idea, this was very anti-socialist. Malthus's main argument is that the reason that wages are so low is because the workforce is too large. And with there's so much competition in the workforce for jobs, it drives down the cost of wages. Now, when people try to deal with extreme poverty, they would have some type of wealth or provisions. Malthus was opposed to that because That'll just encourage them to reproduce, and then they will outstrip their food supply, and it will become even greater misery. Now, Marx and Engels were vehemently, vehemently opposed to the idea. Their idea is that wages were low because of the nature of capitalism, and they criticized Malthus on two grounds. One is they said his argument is ahistorical, and people have different norms and cultural traditions that they do, that they integrate with their lives to regulate their population. Malthus was also very religious and really didn't believe people would, uh, could engage in sexual activity that uh, wouldn't lead to reproduction. He would seem to be opposed to that on, on moral grounds. But in addition to that is Marx and Engels were both really optimistic about technological progress had a lot of trust that whatever ecological limits that people would come against that would cause mass starvation, through technological innovation, people would be able to overcome them. And one of their main criticisms they thought of the economics of their time was that it discouraged technological innovation. It encouraged up to a point, but it didn't encourage it enough that you could guarantee that you would eliminate poverty in the world. And this could only come about through AR and through you know, some type and socialist revolution that would change the nature of the economy. So that criticism has been always there. But for modern eco-socialists, at least a faction of them, in technological innovation has provided opportunities for increased prosperity without damaging the environment. And I think what eco-modernism is just tries to emphasize that point, is that we can rely on technological innovation to help us get over some of our great ecological problems. The Nazis were Malthusians. A lot of early environmentalists were eugenicists. There's a great book called uh, Ecofascism's Lessons from Germany by Janet Beal and Peter Stoudemire. They're, they're two social ecologists, but they sort of have this analysis of the what they refer to as the ecological wing of the Nazi party. And the relationship between Nazism and environmentalism, again, it's, I think it's much more intimate and complicated than a lot of modern day environmentalists are willing to admit. Because it's not just the fact that Hitler was a vegetarian and there's this intimate relationship with eugenicists and early environmentalists, but Martin Heidegger converted to Nazism once they came to power, wrote these long tracts 
which would question the nature of modernity and technology. And he was a very romantic figure. Do you talk about the famous philosopher Heidegger? Yeah, Heidegger. His essay, The Question Concerning Technology, it is really uncritically referenced in a lot of modern rental theory work, where people are saying it's a great work of authority without any real mention of the fact that he joined the Nazi party and the implications of his ideas and how he didn't see Nazism. I don't think there was nearly enough reflection in the environmental movement of people who refer to Heidegger's critique of technology and look at its implications for the types of ideas that the Nazi regime wanted to project into the world. Yeah, and, and I would add to that too that this return to nature, eco austerity, is the yeah. antithesis of what working people who are supposedly the base to build socialism of what they want to hear. I know. I would definitely say that this whole idea of returning to nature, you are hard pressed to find any evidence of it in the world today. I mean, every single trend shows that people enjoy living in cities. They enjoy living closer together. They enjoy the convenience, modernity, and the amenities that cities provide. Because of that, I think it's just a question of like, well, how can we utilize urbanization to benefit the planet rather than trying to expect everyone's going to live in villages? Hey, well, it's obviously not going to happen. People do not want that. And cities provide tons of opportunity to live more harmoniously with the planet because if they're designed properly, they can really prevent a lot of sprawl. You can, it's easy to invest in public transportation, reduce reliance on personal cars. It's easy to live on a lifestyle where you can share a lot of resources and therefore you don't have to produce so much stuff. I think it's, it's really important that we sort of encourage that type of lifestyle because people living upward means they don't have to live outward and they don't have to destroy so much of nature. If you have nuclear power, you could totally decarbonize your economy. And I would add, too, to that, that when they say look at the science, the science says that it's the safest. It is necessary. That's the IPCC and so many other scientific organizations. I mean, it's, it, it, those are consensuses. It, it just blows my mind how people will ignore the IPCC on nuclear power and embrace everything they say on climate change. Yeah, it is unfortunately a great big hypocrisy. You can't pick and choose your science. I, have you heard the latest? Angela Merkel has declared that natural gas is renewable power. Okay, yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, I don't think anyone can look at what Germany has done and not see it as a complete failure. They have not seriously reduced emissions. They basically flatlined emissions. They've had their energy costs skyrocket. The question is, where is the benefit? What metrics are you looking at to say the real benefit? Because the things that you're concerned about, reducing emissions, making sure energy is affordable people, things are obviously not happening in this model. I think it's really important to point out, you go back to the 60s and 70s, when environmentalism was really becoming part of mainstream consciousness. And there was a great concern about resources. And I can have some sympathy with your concern because you look at some of the charts and it looked like, oh, we're using using more and more and more and more. We're going to eventually hit a breaking point. But they don't just keep going up and up and up. They have these breaking points where they start to go down. First, I noticed that with population, where it's, we increase in the rate of population starts to go down, especially in developing countries. Yeah, the more urbanized it is. Yeah, more urbanized it is, yeah. And we're seeing that with resource use. The question is, can we also do that with energy production? There are options available. Nuclear is definitely a great one where if we ramped up the energy production, we would probably see an increase in emissions in the short term. But in the long term, that would curve and start to go down dramatically. You can find that in the United States, reach a certain point, the next people started to live in urban areas, started to come back to sprawl, and started to go back down, and forests came back. Same thing's true with Europe. So we have all these examples. It's just a matter of can we leverage our knowledge and our social institutions to do the same thing when it comes to carbon? I don't see why we couldn't do that. Could you speak a little about eco-socialism? I would say eco-socialism has sort of two main components. One 
It believes that a lot or nearly all of the environmental problems that exist in the world today can be rooted back to our capitalist mode of production. That capitalism creates inefficiencies in the economy, which eventually leads to environmental destruction. And the way we can get around that is if workers take over the means of production and organize things collectively. That would eliminate the profit motive. That would help us plan a rational economy. So some eco-socialists do follow sort of in more of a Marxist trend where they really believe that it's incumbent on the working class. They have a conception of an industrial society. And some are more romantic. They rely on traditions other than Marxism, other than sort of the European Enlightenment. And they believe in a collective economy, but they also believe that it should be not at the industrial state. You could argue that eco-socialists are socialists who, that just emphasize the damage that capitalism does to the environment. Something I find about this left critique of nuclear power that says that there is this nuclear industry and that industry is evil, and they ignore the history of the fossil fuel industry in promoting anti-nuclearism. And of course, the fossil fuel industry is the most powerful industry on the planet. And if you're talking about corporate malfeasance or interference, I mean, it's more on the side of fossil fuels. I mean, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. It's one of the things that is very perplexing and ironic about this whole discussion is that for years there was this intense demonization of nuclear power. And in those years, fossil fuel companies basically got off scot-free for the damage they're doing. And look, in hindsight, it's quite clear that the damage they're doing was orders of magnitude greater. In addition to that, there is this belief that the only reason nuclear power exists today is because of a grand capitalist conspiracy where the owners of nuclear power somehow convince policymakers to bail them out at every turn and that they're relying on a big state handout because they're so inefficient and so destructive. There's no other reason that they would survive. If you just look at the numbers, there's not a lot of evidence for that. If you look at numbers, it's quite clear that nuclear power is very clean and very efficient. But nonetheless, that view persists. And it's very funny because while nuclear power has been demonized and fossil fuels have been so destructive, nuclear power's demonization as its economic efficiency is not ignored. But there's a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of handouts given to renewables that people just forget about. People say that nuclear power is a great big scam. There's a lot of solar panel companies that are just huge scams that are just preying on people's good feelings about solar energy that really pull money out of a lot of people and they rely on a lot of these subsidies and tax breaks to get by. And it's very frustrating to see how damaging renewables can be to poor people and how that is, is just ignored. California had this mandate where they wanted every home to have it on the roof. And it was quite clear to anyone who knew anything about energy policy is that this wasn't going to be efficient. The only thing it did was help drive up the cost of homes in certain areas. And California is in a housing crisis. And the last thing you want to do is drive up the cost of homes. But nonetheless, environmentalists got all behind this project, not realizing that this whole scheme is just a way of gentrifying areas and putting the burden on people who you know, have to pay higher rent or have to pay more for a house to live in. Affording energy costs is a real problem for a lot of low-income people. The federal government in the United States gives out a lot of assistance for people just to pay the bills to keep their lights on and heat on their house. And if we make the cost of energy more expensive in the United States by trying to incorporate all these renewables onto the grid, whether it makes sense or not, what we end up doing is just burdening a lot of poor people. And I think a lot of environmentalists need to become more cognizant of that reality because there's no way we're going to see the massive mobilization we need to see to deal with global warming unless poor working class of people are involved in that. And they're not going to be involved in that if their energy bill gets four times more expensive as a result of it. They're going to turn against it really quickly. In fact, they will turn against the left as a whole. <laughs> yeah. The anti-nuclear movement was started with a donation from Arco Petroleum. Yeah. Today's money of about... $500,000 in today's yeah. 
that was given to the Friends of the Earth when they broke away from the Sierra Club for their support of nuclear power. They realized that environmentalist anxiety about nuclear power was a great way to protect their industries. And they were correct. We're in this catastrophe of global warming we have today because we just stopped building plants. And a lot of reason we stopped building plants because there were social movements against it that were being manipulated and funded by fossil fuel companies. Fast forwarding to the present, I see a dilemma. It's for both the, the left and environmentalism with this whole 100% renewable and how it plays out. Now, we have an election coming up, and the great hope of the environmental movement, the left, is Bernie Sanders. I like Bernie a lot. I trust him the most of any politician. But at the same time, just like other environmentalists, I am concerned, number one, about the climate. Mm-hmm. because it's just potentially an existential threat. It just could be super, super catastrophic if you don't get it under control. So here's Bernie saying we've got a climate emergency, but he wants to shut down all the nuclear power plants, and he wants to end all research on advanced reactors that will eat up nuclear waste and turn it into energy and that can't melt down and are very cheap. And on top of that, he wants to spend like a trillion dollars a year on 100% renewables, and that's something that the Germans have spent a half a trillion dollars on over 20 years, I believe, and it's been a major boondoggle. And it creates a dilemma and a fear in me, uh, both at the same time. The dilemma being that we do need climate action, but the solution is a dead end. It's an Achilles heel as far as getting elected, and if it was ever implemented, it could bankrupt the country. And it could turn people against progressive politics very sharply because they will definitely blame the left for this boondoggle. I'm originally from Vermont, so I grew up with him always in the background of politics. The generation he's a part of, the people he's associated with Vermont, share sort of that back-to-land mentality. And that, I think, sort of explains Sanders' own hostility to nuclear power. He also has some other beliefs that I kind of want to him, like he's always been a big proponent of alternative medicine. He's never gotten to the the side of being a real anti-vaxxer, but he always has promoted, like, you know, we need to look at these alternative modalities, even though a lot of people will agree that they're bogus. He had a suspicion of genetically modified crops. He's kind of fallen back on that, backed away from that. The thing that I think is reassuring is that even though he comes from that, so that's his kind of fallback, he is actually a very pragmatic politician. His time as mayor of Burlington, he actually was in conflict with some of the environmentalists because he realized what he needed to do to actually meet accomplish the goals that he wanted to accomplish was much different from what his people were calling for. So... I have some small hope that his pragmatism may win out if he gets elected. I'll admit that's just an article of faith, that's hope. But his his energy policy is very frustrating. It's just a hodgepodge of things that aren't put together. He has people like Bill McKinnon who are really advising him, who I don't think are very educated, knowledgeable energy policy. And it reaches for targets that the scientific community has said it's unachievable. If you look at polls, a broad swath of Americans do want to address climate change, both Republicans and Democrats, and you can have a really strong majority of them if you have a mixed energy option. If you say, yeah, we'll pursue wind and solar and hydro, and we'll also pursue nuclear. That is kind of way of forming the biggest coalition here in the United States to do it. If you go to 100% renewables, you know, majority of Democrats will agree with you, but it's much harder to get independents and Republicans on board. And as the examples have shown, it's just not possible. So I'm hoping that maybe Sanders will come around on this issue. He'll realize that some of the goals he set are not realistic, but it, it's frustrating. It's very frustrating. It, the only consolation is that it's not just him. There's very few leaders in the Democratic Party who don't buy into this. He does seem the most extreme of all the uh, presidential candidates. In the yeah. But on the other hand, I, I like a lot of other things he talks about. Pete Buttigieg, Elizabeth Warren, all of them said that they want to phase out nuclear power. Warren is the most extreme about it. The only two that have really 
given indication they're supportive of it is Andrew Yang and Cory Booker. Joe Biden, honestly, he's, he hasn't really clarified. Yeah, he's spoken in favor of small modular reactors. The thing about politics, especially in the United States, is that everything's a coalition. And so you have variety of coalitions are vying for power. And what the left is, and the same thing with the right, is a coalition of different interest groups that are sort of struggling to see who gets to set the agenda. And if a part of that coalition that I may disagree with sets the agenda, that may be really unfortunate and it may come up with some very broad policies. But because they're just a part of a coalition, if the other parts sort of organize against them or minimize them, you can still reach other things that you would like. Is it possible to predict, though, the outcome of that? It's a gamble. So what do you think about eco-modernism? There's a lot of things about eco-modernism that I really agree with. I can say that Michael Scherenberger and Ted Nordhaus's book, The Death of Environmentalism, it had a real impact on me. What I value with eco-modernism is that it does say, look, we need to have an environmentalism that works congruent with modernity. Modernity has given us technological innovation. It's also given us more equal relations with gender. You know, it's broken down a lot of these barriers that we had um, were very damaging to us as people. So it, it has this very strong humanistic element. I think that all should be embraced. A criticism which I think other people about eco-modernism is that the emphasis are on technology and sort of these other values, but eco-modernism itself may be sort of too politically neutral. And so it can be adopted for a lot of people for a lot of different ends without necessarily having a, a, an idea of the overall picture uh, of societal transformation. Yeah. I know that that was one of the criticisms people had of the Eagle Modernist Manifesto. They said, you know, there's a lot of the stuff in the manifesto I agree with, but there isn't enough of determining who are the real targets and what are the real institutions we need to change a more ecologically sensitive society. Not a mistake, really, because you need to build a broad constituency. Mm -hmm. oh, I would agree. Yeah. You know, it's even worse than that, though, and this is true of all movements, is that the uh, most extremist elements tend to come out on top. And I think this is true of all political movements. Political movements are driven by the most dedicated people. Yeah. And the most yeah. dedicated people tend to be extremist. Mm -hmm. The most dedicated people also, by being extremists, are intolerant of other views. So in order to have unity, the extremists end up setting the tone and, uh, of what the movement is. And it works in the short run, but in the long run, it doesn't work. Giving way to the extremists could be a path to victory. But if you really want lasting results, free thought must reign. Yeah, there's a division between reason and passion. Well, why can't you be passionate about reason and being reasonable? You know, there's one thing I, I see too, like within, within the left, this thing about diversity. And I'm all for it. Diversity of race, diversity of religion. But the one thing that where diversity is missing is diversity of thought. There's all these litmus tests. And I think the left has painted itself into a corner. But you also run the risk of uh, not being so clear in your message. And it is about striking the balance between those two things. There are some people, though, who get too obsessed with trying to push people out, trying to make sure everyone is on the same page. If, we, if everyone just has the most clear ideology, then we can all work as one under that ideology. And it's true if you do that, you can get everyone to sort of work in one action, but you destroy your power. You cannot ever organize too far in front of the people that the people don't want to follow you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Well, anyhow, it was very nice having you on. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. You know, I want to thank you. And this has been Gabe Ignetti and Marco Masia Rosero Rossi. I'd be saying goodbye to everybody and thank you for tuning in. Take care. We'll see you next time.